Hey, yes. Welcome. This is the uh, multiplayer game from scratch workshop. Uh, over the next hour and a half, we're going to make a multiplayer game. I'll be a very simple one, but um, hopefully it's fun. Um, if, you know, if anyone's following along, feel free to say, hey, hold up. And uh, I could come over, take a look. And there's also people in the room here that are very knowledgeable, besides myself, that are probably could jump in and help as well. Um, and then for anyone that's online, uh, go ahead and ask questions. Obviously, it'll be harder for me to tell uh, what's going wrong, if anything is happening on your side. But um, maybe we could help. Cool. Come on in. If anyone's following along, you're going to want to like, get next to a plug, because your laptop will not survive this. We're going to be compiling everything. We're going to be asset processing. It'll be highs and lows. Is anyone? Anyone? Say again. Mac is not supported. Uh, you can you can install O3D on Mac. I haven't tried it myself, but I've tried on Linux, which is. There you go. But yeah, if you want to follow along, you'll want to plug it in. Cool. So does everyone have uh, the October of this year latest release on their machine? Who, who, who's going to follow along? Do, they, do you guys have it? Yes? I'm looking. OK. Cool. Awesome. All right. So before we get started, there's going to be a little bit of downtime. Like I said, I want to like make a project from scratch. So there's no project yet in existence, and we're going to create it. Uh, so let's do that first, and then I'll just because that takes time, and then I'll start talking about sort of other topics that we could get into. Um, so go ahead and open up your um, project manager. This is what I have open up here, and we're going to create a new project. And this is one of the, um, I would say, the cool new feature of the October release is that uh, we have a new multiplayer template. So uh, if you were following along from last year or just a fan in general, you would know that in order to get a multiplayer project started, there's quite a few steps. You would have to go and update some CMake files. You'd have to bring in your own spawners. Uh, that's all done for us using our new remote template system. So you could hit Add Remote Template, and it'll give you a URL. And go ahead and type in this new URL, um, https github.com slash o3de slash o3de dash extras extras dot get. And yeah, you want to be connected to the network as well. Go ahead and hit Add. And then now you see that it automatically found a template in there called Multiplayer. Go ahead and click on that. And you don't have it yet on your computer, so go ahead and hit Download. And you download it wherever. This looks good. And while that's downloading over the very slow conference network, I'll make my project, um, we'll call it my multiplayer game. Show of hands, who's messed with much networking in O3DE? OK, cool. All right. Fresh start. Looks like the app might have, well, it's not responsive. We'll give it a second. Oh, look at that. Came back. Oh, and it's done downloading. Cool. See, you always just. 
Got to wait for good things. All right, my multiplayer game. And we'll create a project. It'll say it needs to be rebuilt. That's cool. And go ahead and build this. So this will take a few minutes. Um, yeah, just make sure that when you're building it down here, you see that it says O3DE SDK. So you definitely want to make sure you're building it with an SDK and not doing a full build. Right? A full build will take hours. But this will be uh, you know, using one that I've already installed. So it'll be on this laptop, two minutes on a home PC, less than a minute. Anyone stuck so far? Can you show the URL again? Yeah. Actually, could go there. It's a, um, it's a, a github.com slash O3DE slash uh, O3DE, sorry, O3DE slash O3DE dot extras. So let me go. So this one here. And um, make sure you put .git at the end of it. That'll tell the um, project manager. It'll make that checkbox go green. OK, it's done compiling. Hopefully everyone else has done. Uh, open editor. And we'll let asset processor, this will be the longest downtime in the entire project. I promise. Uh, yeah, so if you're on a laptop, on this laptop, it takes like 14 minutes. If you're at home, on a PC, maybe eight, something like that. Um, did that link work out for you? OK. So I'll open up Asset Processor just to see how far along we are. Uh, OK, yeah. So while that's going, though, let's talk about what we'll cover today. Um, well, the first thing we covered already was the uh, project template, um, which you already saw, which you know is going to help us make a multiplayer game. Uh, it's just a nice starting point. Um, we could open it up. Uh, open up the code now, but if you look, there's some some nice uh, some nice components already in there. Actually, here, let's use this. So everything we're seeing here would be something that you would have written yourself, component-wise. Uh, so like, yeah. So there's player spawners in here, there's an animation component, there's an AI, some weapons, uh, and we'll open this up and we'll, we'll check it out. Oh, network spawner, uh, prefab spawner stuff. So really useful things to get started. Uh, and the next thing we'll touch on that you know, isn't too common um, is AZ code gen. So we're gonna be turning essentially XML files into C++ code. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll go poke around in those and see what, what gets generated. Um, we're going to cover uh, you know, various network paradigms. So we're going to cover like network input, uh, creating that input, processing that input. We're going to cover network properties. And we're also going to cover RPCs. Um, Let's see how we're doing here. OK. It looks like we're halfway done already. I, I like to talk about just some of the basic components of multiplayer, though. So I think it's good to, there's, there's just so much we could talk about. And I want to narrow down for this 
for this workshop. Um, so, so some of the components that we'll, we'll be getting into, right? We have like the transport layer. These are like the zeros and ones that get sent across the network for, you know, like if you're syncing up player movement. This we will definitely, we won't be looking at the transfer layer, but this is what we're definitely utilizing. Uh, then you have like the runtime aspect, which is the game client, the game server. Um, sorry, did you have your hands raised? No, no, sorry. Um, what we're not talking about right now is like the back end. So there's a bunch of services you can use for for powering backend, like matchmaking, player identification, that we're not covering here. Uh, we're not talking about fleets, so we're, we're not talking about you know, a de scaling dedicated servers. We're just gonna keep it on this machine, and I mean, in theory, if we're connected on the same network and we set up our components similarly, um, you could put this on a computer next to you, and you could you know, play across the network. Oh yeah, we're in some we're in some big assets right now. These are going a lot slower. Uh, okay, let's talk about some topology. Uh, we have a concept of local multiplayer, right? This is if you're just the client application. This is you're at home on your couch. You and your friend have a controller. You're playing on this on one client. Uh, this has its limitations, right? You can't stuff a million people into your house. <laughs> you probably can't even stuff 10 people into your house. It would be hard putting them on a couch, we'll say that. Uh, another uh, topology we have is LAN, which uh, was very popular back in the day, I'd say. Had definitely had some fun LAN parties. But this is played on different computers, but you're all on the same network. And so there's no internet connection required. Um, this has the benefit, you know, there's virtually no latency because you're connected directly. I mean, there's a little bit. Uh, but we're not talking about this either today. Um, ooh, we're close, we're getting in. There's peer-to-peer. -peer. This is over the internet. Uh, it, this is, in a pure sense, this is where every player is connected to every other player. Uh, it's, it's cheap, right? You don't need to have your own servers for this. But there are some security concerns, right? Everyone knows everyone else's IP. Um, there's also peer-to-peer, -peer, and I think this is maybe what people think about more when they hear peer-to-peer -peer is like player-hosted client server. Uh, this is where one client acts as the authority. So it's not on a server somewhere else, there is someone who's actually playing, and they are the authority over all the other players. Um, this has a drawback, though, of course, right? So, so the person who is hosting has the advantage, let's say, right? They're, they're at time zero, where everyone else from around the world is sending their, their network input to, to them, and so their game's gonna run a lot smoother than everyone else's. Uh, what happens when this host rage quits, right? There, there goes everyone's game. Uh, and, and cheating is a huge issue, right? As soon as you have it, have something on the person's machine, they could go wild. Uh, it is cheap. It is cheap. Uh, and um, O3D does support uh, client-hosted client server. Uh, we won't be getting into that today. So what we'll be doing is we'll, it'll be on the same computer, but we'll be opening up a separate app uh, a dedicated server, locally. Uh, and then we get into dedicated servers. So what are the benefits here? So perform it, right? You have a completely separate machine. In our case, not. But ideally, you'd have a completely separate machine running the, the dedicated server. So, I mean, you, you can control specific to your game or your application, how powerful do you need this thing to be? How many of these servers do you need in existence? Uh, you could scale these things, right? You could use fleets, you could use game lift. Um, global distribution, that's huge. So like what we were talking about earlier where the client hosted, um, in, in client hosted where the, 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 
the player who's hosting would have an advantage. Now you could set up servers in such a way that everyone who's connecting to them are sort of the same distance away. So if there's any lag, they're all kind of equally laggy, which is nice. Uh, then security, you're controlling the server. So you could, it's a lot easier to make that hack proof. Reliability. Um, now it's going to cost more. So, you know, that's an extra machine someone's going to have to pay for. Uh, but yeah, that's what we're going to be looking at today. And um, are there any questions so far? Okay. Is anyone following along? Oh, sick. All right, cool. Since it let me in the editors, you know, I guess these assets aren't essential. They're not critical assets, so I might be able to like poke around in here. We can do that. Let's try it. Okay. So let's open up the demo level. It, it's just what already exists. Yeah, this comes with the multiplayer template. We're gonna make our own level, but for now, let's check this out. Oh yeah, look at all those warnings. That's great. And yeah, so these uh, squares here, looks like their asset hasn't loaded yet. So let's just wait for asset processor. Won't get ahead of myself. Oh yeah, yeah, I mean you could, you, it's quite easy. When you initialize multiplayer, you just pass in like the multiplayer agent type you want. But yeah, when we hit control G right here, it's gonna start a dedicated server. And in, in fact, in editor, when we're playing in, edit mo in editor play mode, it's gonna be dedicated server. We don't yet support client server in editor play mode, if that makes sense, yeah. Sure. Apart from being educational, which is obviously very important, is there any reason to use this kind of multiplayer setup over something like GameLink or some other service that someone else already has? So, like I was saying earlier, this is independent of that, right? So, so you could use this is the runtime, this is the game itself. If you wanted to have some back end service for like scaling how many servers you have, any of that, we're, we're not covering that today, but, uh, but you could, yeah. All right. Oh, these cubes just look like they just never actually spawned in. That's questionable, but okay. All right, let's, let's, uh, let's hit Control-G in this level. See what happens. Basically, I want to prove to you that we are indeed running a multiplayer game right now. OK, so I have a robot. I could run around. I could run into boxes. Great. Uh, you see some clues that you're running a multiplayer in the lower, in the lower right-hand corner. You see multiplayer client status connected. All right, but a lot of times what I've heard is like, I see that, I don't believe it. I don't believe this is actually multiplayer. I'm gonna prove it a little bit further just to drive it home. So by default, the editor server is turned, is hidden. So if 
you don't have to do this, but um, I'm going to set the CVAR locally just so you can see it. So editor SV hidden false. Editor SV, editor SV, meaning editor server. RHI override. So now when we run, you'll see a, a dedicated server actually pop up. So, so there's a separate app, and actually we got one monitor here. Let's minimize this just a bit and bring it over into a corner. So here. See my editor, my player's running around. There's a completely separate dedicated server app that is also uh, running around. OK. So I hope that really drives home that, yes, indeed, this is a multiplayer game. Um, cool. Let, let's try to get uh, two clients. That's always good. So right now in editor play mode, you could only have one client at a time. Uh, but if you open up the server directly, you could spawn in other clients. So I'm going to go to the project folder, and I'm going to click on, there's a command that exists called launch server. Nothing that fancy going on here. Uh, it's just opening up server launcher exe and then opening up a level and calling host. But we'll do that. So we're opening the server up. Cool. And once your server's open, if you hit the home key, it'll open the I'm GUI menu, and you can go to multiplayer and launch local client. And I'll be pressing that twice, and then hopefully we'll see two players. Sorry. I'm Moving this around, I hit tilde to open the console so I could grab the mouse. And we'll jump back to the server, launch another client. Cool. And let's free this one up. Oh. There we go. All right. So, let's see if we can run around here. Woo. Cool. OK. So yeah, so we have two clients and a dedicated server. And my laptop hates me right now. All right. Let's close these out. Was everyone uh, able to like get that level loaded and see it on Mac? All right, let's make our first multiplayer component. Um, oh, I should state that uh, what, I, what ideally the end goal would be is, uh, I called it a multiplayer drag race, but really I don't care about the car graphics. We're going to remove all need for pretty graphics. We're just going to concentrate on multiplayer, and I want two players next to each other, and moving forward. And the forward movement is just based on how fast you can mash your keys on your keyboard. So I call it a drag race because it's just going in a straight line. Um, so let's, let's start our player component. Let's go to gems, code, source, autogen. And um, so there's a bunch of XMLs in here. These XMLs were the ones I was talking about earlier where we're going to define our multiplayer component in an XML, and Autogen is auto automatically going to turn it into a C++ component for us. Let's copy, uh, I mean, copy any one of these. I'm going to copy Network Weapon. And I'm going to rename it to 
I'm going to rename it to O3D con player dot auto component. Don't forget the dot auto component. Okay, let's open that up. And I'm going to remove everything from here. Okay, so here's the start of our component. Let's name it. I'm going to call it O3D con player. And the namespace is the name of the game. That's great. My multiplayer game in my case. False. We'll talk about this later. So override component, override controller, we're going to both make those false for now. And we won't need an override include. But we do know that we'll need some sort of input, right? I want to mash the keyboard locally. My player is going to mash on the keyboard, and it's going to send that input to the dedicated server and move our player forward. So let's make a network input. And it's just going to be a, a number. Make it an int, and we'll call it buttons mashed. And we'll initialize that to 0. Cool. Uh, at this point, let's open up Visual Studio. So we're going to compile again. It's in the build folder, if you're not familiar. And before I forget, uh, any new file, any new code file you add, CMake needs to know about it, so let's add it. So I'm going to go to the your game name underscore files.cmake, and let's add in that XML. O3D con player. Hit save. Okay. And let's build. I'm going to make my editor the startup project once it's done building. Cool. So right out of the box, we haven't done any custom code. We just created the XML and let AutoGen uh, do its magic. This component will be available. So let's, let's go ahead and make our asset, our player asset, and you know, attach all the components we want to it. And then we could start adding some custom code. Let's make a new level. We'll call it O3D con level. OK. And I'm going to make my player. O3D con player. And let's look for that component we just made. There it is. Sweet. Let's add it. All right. Uh, it's missing some required components. Okay, the first one that said it's missing is local uh, prediction player input. That's because we included that network input, so we'll add one of those. And a network binding. 
Anything that's being sent over the network will need that. And it says we're done. OK. Um, well, I want to see myself, so I'm going to add a mesh. We'll do that, too. Going to add a mesh, and I'll do something simple. I'm going to use a cylinder. OK, let's see. There I am. OK. Uh, yeah. I'm going to turn this into a, a prefab. I'm going to make my player prefab. All right. Uh, another thing we're going to want is a player spawner. So unlike normal control G in single player mode, you need to wait for the dedicated server to tell you what uh, network entities should be in the game. And that requires us to have a player spawner. So if you do a search for player spawner, there's a prefab already available. I'm going to drop two of them in the level. Basically, you need as many of these as you want players. Um, actually, that's not even true. If you have, let's say you have two of these and four players spawn in, by default, they'll just alternate. It's a round robin style spawner. And open up the player spawner, and right now it's default to the robot we saw earlier. Just change it to our player. So O3D con player. OK. So now we have two spawners in the level. I'm going to offset them. So I want one of them, let's say, to the left by two meters. And I'll put the other one to the right two meters. Right, It's a drag race. So we want our two players to be right next to each other, slightly off set. And let's see, I'm going to delete the player from the scene, save the level, and then I'm going to hit Control G again. And we're going to see if the server starts up and we see at least one player into the, into the game. And right, we want to see a cylinder. See anything? I don't see a cylinder. Let's check our spawners again. Oh, look at this. This spawnable asset here, you want to make sure you select the network spawnable. Um, actually, I think in development latest, this is the October build, but if you, the October release, if you use development latest, it'll stop you from doing this. So make sure you select the, the network product. All right, now we'll hit save. Wait for the server to start. OK. We see a cylinder. Doesn't look like it's in the right place. Right? We know our shader ball is at 0, 0. We had set up our level so that it was offset. So there should be like one to the right or one to the left. Does anyone have a guess why that's not working? Why, would, why the transform is? Yes, correct. You're not sending the transform over the network yet. So let's update our player. So I'm going to grab my player prefab again. And this time, I'm going to add the network transform. OK. Save that. Delete them from the level. And let's try that again. So now we should see it offset. Oh, look at that. Thank you. I'm glad you were here. Cool. And let's make that shader ball a little bit smaller. But I like the shader ball being there. It's cool. It's like our center spot. But I'm just going to scale them down. All right. OK. Now it is time 
to add some custom logic, right? Our player is really boring right now. We need some custom logic to actually tell our player to move. So let's do that. I'm going to close the editor. And let's open up the XML once again. And this time, let's set this override controller to true. And we're going to give it a file that we'll create. So the override will be uh, source components o3d con player dot h. Let's give just a little background here. So a controller is going to be logic that's ran on anything that has control over this particular entity. So there's two cases where this happens. One is on the server. So the server has authority over all the network entities. In the case of a player, it's a special case because you still want to have control of that player. You don't have entire control over that player. The server really has control over the player, but we're going to at least make you feel like you have control. Uh, and that is so that you know, when you press WASD on the keyboard, you're allowed to move yourself up, assuming you're not cheating. The server will be totally cool with it. And it'll let you move up instantly instead of waiting for like you press W and then you ask the server, is that OK? And then you know, a quarter of a second later, the server says, sure. And then you move. That would feel really bad. So anyways, that's controller. So an autonomous player has a controller, and the server also has a controller. Component logic is logic that's ran on every machine. So like clients, server, they'll be able to run anything inside the quote component logic. Uh, but for now, since we're moving, we, we, we want to control the thing, we're going to override just the controller for now. Cool. Um, oh, this will be fun. Let's compile this. All right, we get an error. Cannot open include file source components o3d con player dot h no such file. That's fine. We didn't make it yet, so okay, we're good. Compiler's letting us know what's up. So let's go make that file. O3dcon player dot h. CPP. And next question is like, what do we put in this file? Well, thankfully, Autogen has provided a starting point for us. So let's go see what Autogen created. And you do that by going into your, um, your games module. And there's a generated files folder. And if these look familiar, that's because these are corresponding to all the XMLs we created. So there is a o3d con player dot auto component dot h, and let's open that up. So it's a few hundred lines of code, and you can see there's things in here that um, might look foreign, might look familiar. Uh, let's look for something familiar. We would have, we would see like our network input in here somewhere, right? Um, what do we call it? Button button mash there, m buttons mashed. OK, so it generated something based on our XML. Uh, towards the top, it tells you what you, as a starting point, what you can place inside of your custom header file. So let's do that. I'm just going to copy and paste that in. Is 
Is there a, I think I put a space there. Let's back up. Yeah. And our CPP. Uh, now's a good point where it gets hard, like, listening and typing. So I would suggest going to um, my, um, my Git repo with all this code in it. And you could probably just grab two files, and it will save you a lot of time. So if you get lost, you can just copy and paste from here. Uh, but those two files will be the, um, the XML that were created. So gem code source autogen. So if you wanted to, or if there's someone next to you with a computer, if you want to extreme program it, if you're working on it and someone else is giving you backup, uh, yeah, this file here, as well as the custom code we're making, which is under components. So three files. So the XML and then the .h and .cpp. So yeah, that should be easy to find. Uh, GitHub.com slash amzn dash gene. And from there, you could find the workshop. Cool. Um, yeah, let's, let's let CMake know about the files we just created. Always have to remember that. So what have we done? We've told CMake uh, about our, our player. We've added in the template logic that AZ CodeGen created for us. Let's compile again. Is anyone behind that needs to catch up? Okay. Sweet. Success. Okay. Yeah. Let's um let's start adding some custom logic. So I'm going to open up that player. Source components, O3D con player, sweet. Um, okay, so let's see, we're making input. This would be, this part is not gonna be network specific, so I'll just try to blast past this. Again, look at the repo, but I'm just gonna grab any old keyboard input. Um, yeah, let's see what we want here. Going to need to include some import and in input stuff. It's AZ framework, input events, and we'll grab the, the input channel event listener, all right. And we will derive from AZ framework, input channel event listener, 
uh, I'll, I'll make a note here. This is probably, uh, absolute, I'm actually positive it's probably not what you do in your actual game. Uh, there are you know, better uh, input, starter input gems you could use for this. I'm just gonna grab raw keyboard input because we don't really care about like making it really, uh, you know, having like tying events to inputs and stuff like that. So we're gonna do the quick method and yeah, we're going to need to grab the event when that ha happens. Oh, IntelliSense, I love you. Okay. And we're gonna need to keep track of like how many keys we pressed. So I'm gonna do keep track of the numbers of keys we pressed and we'll keep track of if we're currently pressing a key, right? Because we don't wanna just, you know, be holding down a key or like, yeah, we want people to actually have to like lift their fingers up and down in order to win this game. So, all right, let's go over to the CPP and on activate, we're gonna need to make sure we're just getting those, um, those keyboard events and we only care if we are a, well this is networking specific, so we'll only care if we are an autonomous net entity role. So autonomous is for the player, right? So it's someone that has ownership, so they have a controller, uh, but it's not the server, it's you. It's like you're on the client and you, you wanna control it, you wanna listen for a keyboard input. And we'll connect. And likewise, we'll want to disconnect when our entity is deactivated. Okay. Cool. Um, okay. These two methods were generated from, for us by the multiplayer code gen. So this is definitely of interest, but before we create any input or process it, we need to grab it from the keyboard itself. So let's do that. And we had that one override, this was the one, yep. Okay, let's just grab keyboard input. Um, you know what, this is a great case. Let's just save time here. I'll follow, I'll practice what I preach. Let's go in here and we'll grab the keyboard input code. Look at that. All right, great. Quick rundown, you can look at this. We're just going to ignore everything that's not a keyboard. We're gonna see if something's being pressed and if we're not already pressing something, we're gonna keep track of that. So, so we could skip to the fun part, multiplayer stuff. All right, so there, there's these create inputs. Uh, there's a create input and a process input method that got generated. This is, um, this is, this is really important for multiplayer, right? So like, normally on a single player game, you might just grab keyboard input and then move your player right away, right? These are special methods so that you create the input at the right time. And what do we mean by the right time? So in a, in a networked game, everything needs to stay in sync and in order to do that, you have like very specific network frames, right? So you want to know, and the server and you and everyone else needs to be on the same page that like on frame 100, I actually did something. Like I actually pushed forward. And this is going to let you keep everything in sync. So uh, this is really cool, but basically this create input will get triggered. I think it's like once uh, or 30 times a second or something like this. Uh, it's tied to physics. Um, 
it will get called whenever it's ready. So, it's, so when the network is ready, it's going to ask basically, what did you press in this frame? And that way, everyone could be staying. You know, everyone could stay in sync. So the create input side, that's only for the player. The process input side will be for the player as well. So, you know, right after you create input, the player will then process the input. So if you pressed forward on the keyboard, or in our case, if you mashed 10 buttons last frame, you could go ahead and say, move me up 10 spaces, and that will happen right away. What this also does is we'll call process input on the server. And so the server will know on this particular network frame, you press 10 keys on the keyboard, so move up. Um, yeah, I just think that's, that's really cool. So it kind of takes, you know, takes all that hard work out of it and gives you two methods for making it quite simple. Um, so let's return the input that we uh, need to. So I'm going to grab the player input. And we'll fill it out. So there's only one input we have, right? There's buttons mashed. That's what we expected, right? That ties back to that XML. There we go. Buttons, buttons mashed. That's directly tied to this input we're providing here. So we're going to say, um, uh, we need to fill that out with what we recorded, right? So. Oh, what did I do? Excuse me. So that variable is m underscore keys pressed. And since we grabbed the input, we're going to clear that out after we're done with it. OK. Looks good. Uh, on the flip side, we're going to process the input. And for now, let's not do anything but print out some information just to make sure, sanity check, that we are getting input and processing it. So same thing here, find component input with our player, O3Dcon player network input. And we'll say that if we've pressed anything at all, if M's M underscore buttons mashed greater than zero. We're just going to say, hey, we, we pressed something. So we'll log a warning. Player pressed something keys. Boom. And we'll pass that in. And then we'll go and play and make sure everything is good before we start actually moving the player forward. OK. Let's compile. Oh, what I do? Oh. Yeah, let's not make it const. How about that? Is someone going to be able to play with me across the network right now? Come on. Come on. <laughs> it's OK. No pressure. Uh, would be cool, though. Actually, I'm not, not even sure my uh, work computer would like that security-wise. I don't know. OK. All right, so what do we expect? 
our player's not booming yet, but like we should be getting some warnings uh, about keys being pressed. I'm gonna hit Control G, wait for the server to start up. Oh, and our, our logs aren't showing here, but let me just mash on the keyboard. Oh, look at that, our camera's moving too. That's, that's not good. But let's scroll down to the bottom of the console log here. And do we see any warnings about keys being pressed? We do. Player pressed one key. One key. Come on, I was, I was pressing faster than that. Three keys. There we go. Look at that. Lightning fast. Cool. Uh, oh, another thing to notice, too. So see how this says, you know, our normal warning here in yellow will say player pressed one key, this network frame. That's this client. So like the, the player is getting that information. There's also these logs coming through from the editor server. So the editor server is piping its own warnings to us so that we can see it. And so that's really useful. So we know that both me, the player, and the server are both being able to process this player input, which is great. It's exactly what we want. Cool. So let's, um, now that we prove that we're grabbing keyboard input and all that, let's actually make the player move. So where are we going to want to make the player move? It's going to happen in the process input. That's our time to do stuff. So yeah, let's do that. I guess we could get rid of this warning for now. Or forever. Good riddance. And we'll just make some magic variables here. We'll say movement per button press. Magic numbers don't look oh. Yeah, we'll move we'll move uh, 0.1 game units every time the key gets pressed. And then we'll make a vector for the delta. Let's do that. It'll be a forward vector. In our case, forward is the y-axis. And then we'll do movement per button press times the number of times we mashed on the keys. And we'll move the player. So we'll get, get the transform and then set the translation. Set world translation. And we'll move it up by the delta. So OK, let's do that again. So we're going to get the transform. All right, so we're just getting the current translation and adding some to it. So plus the delta. That looks good to me. Let's run it. Look at that. Oh, yeah, that's good. Oh, as long as, you know, I got to turn off that camera movement. But, mm, sweet. OK. <laughs> let me turn off the cameras. Uh, not turn off the camera. Let me turn off the camera's movement. We'll disable that fly camera. OK. But I think everyone saw that it was moving forward. That's cool. Uh, another thing that's always fun, um, well, yeah, 
let's mash into some boxes. I want, I want to prove a point, but basically uh, we have, uh, we've shipped some rigid body boxes with the um, multiplayer template. What did I call them? Let's see. Network. Let's look for all the prefabs. No. Oh. I'm going to open up the project and in the prefab folder, there should be some uh, network boxes. Oh, there isn't actually. Okay. Well, let's make one. That is unusual, actually. Okay. Um, but uh, the point I wanted to drive is that when you are making a character for real, you're probably not going to just want to move the trans to transform. You're going to want to use like physics character controllers. Um, and that is so that you could interact with the world, like physically. So if we were to make a box, actually, you know what? I'm just going to grab the box because I'm sure there's one that exists. Actually, yeah, I think I know what will happen. If you go to where your template got downloaded, we're just going to grab the box from there. So I'm going to go to my template and grab the network rigid body cube prefab. And I'm just, just go ahead and copy that into your own project. The, um, the template was set up in such a way, I think, that it wasn't copied over. So, but if you've downloaded the template, you'll have that box. It doesn't take that long to create to begin with, but let's, to save time, we'll just go ahead and grab that. All right. So I'm going to copy that box into my project. Control C. And here's my prefabs. Control V. Oh, yeah. All right, cool. Let's just start dropping these into the level. Ooh. Cool. I'm just going to create a few of these. I'm using Control D to duplicate. So I'm going to play this and just, just to iterate that when you move, I'm just going to pass through those boxes like a ghost, which is not fun. So let's, let's update this to use a, um, an actual character controller like you would in your game. So um, yeah, let's open up our player again. I'm going to drag my O3D con player. And I'm going to add a network character controller. Mm. Boom. OK, so I've added a network character. And this has requirements. And it wants me to bring in a physics character controller. So we'll go ahead and do that. And that seems good. I don't know if we want to. Um, can we see this capsule? Yeah, let's make it a little bit bigger. Save that. And also, I am going to, I don't like how our camera's set up. Let's give it a better view. So I'm going to turn off the debug.
I'm trying to get rid of that flashing, which, there, no, okay. We'll just leave, let that be then. Let's be this camera and I'm just gonna give us a better viewing angle here. Yeah, something like that. Cool, that looks good. Save that out. Cool. Uh, so yeah, so in our code, we're still moving the, the, trans, the transform directly. So let's update that so we're uh, using the character controller. Just make sure you delete your character from the level. And we'll go back into our XML. So open up your character XML, the O3DCon player. And what we'll do is we're going to add a, um, we're gonna add a component relation. So uh, let's, let's just see what this has to fill out. Um, there's a few things going on here. So we're going to, we're going to say that any, anyone using our O3DCon player component is going to need to have a network character component attached to it. Uh, so, well, we've already attached one to ours, but what this is also going to do is give us quick access to it through code. And that particular network component has a really useful method on it for moving people, or you know, moving your, your character through space. So let's fill that out. So that's going to look like component relation. And here we go, IntelliSense. Okay, so the first one's constraint. We're gonna say that it's required. And has controller, true, right? We're gonna ask, we're going to ask our network character component to move, and we need a controller for this. The name, most important part, probably, network character component. And the namespace, this is part of the multiplayer gem. So not the project, the game project itself, but the multiplayer gem. And I think the last thing, yeah, last thing in here is the file path to the network character component. And that is located under multiplayer components, network character component. Cool. Okay, so let's recompile this. And once we do that, we'll go back to our player and update the players so that instead of moving with uh, you know, setting transform directly, we're grabbing this network character component and asking it to move. Success. Okay. All right, let's see, so um, let's see what network, let's see what network character component actually gives us. So I'm gonna say git network character component controller. So see, it's, our, it's already here for us. Uh, that's why we need to compile. Is so the auto gen is giving us, uh, well, updated our base class to give us quick access to the network character component controller. And the one we care about is this try move with velocity. And what does this accept? Okay, it takes a velocity and a time. So we know we're gonna need a velocity. Uh, and we, also, we already have delta time passed in for us, so we'll at least know that. And we'll make, we will make a delta vector once again. Let's do that. Okay, so I'm going to 
let's do let's um, I shouldn't have deleted what I just wrote. <laughs> We're going to do the same thing, basically. Uh, yeah, we'll do a movement per button press. So movement per button press. And we'll make that a forward vector. And this is velocity, so hmm. we'll give it uh, 10, magic number. 10 meters per second, I guess. And we will, um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. We'll create our delta vector now. And that will be our movement per button press times our buttons mashed, right? build it. Oh, warnings treated as errors. Let's make sure we're dealing with floats. All right, but now what we expect to see now that we're moving with the character controller is we can interact with those boxes in the world, and they'll be all synced up across the network. Moment of truth. Oh, notice the boxes aren't there anymore, right? That's, so anything networked locally goes away, right? Because we're waiting for the server to tell us what to spawn in. All right, I'm gonna press some buttons. Oh yes, victory, cool. All right, so we're starting to see a real character controller. Um, what else do we want to see? We probably want to see the player ID. And in order to do this, let's start tapping into another concept known as network properties. So let's make a network property, which is going to be synced over the network to display our player ID overhead. So in our case, you know, in a real game, it might be your name. Uh, in our case, we'll just send like a number, and the, the host will tell us well, the host will assign us a number based on how many players are already in the game. So like the first player will be player zero, second player will be player one, and we want to see those overhead because if we're racing one another, we want to know who's who, right? Oh, I left this in. Come on, you, gotta, you have to yell at me when I do stuff like that. Okay. So let's make a network property. Network property and a lot of different attributes that we could apply to it. We just gotta start filling them all out. Um, yeah, first will be the type. We'll say it's an integer, because we're just gonna send like what player we are, zero, one, two, three, four, whatever. Our name will be the player ID. Init value, negative one. Replicate from. So network properties have a replicate from and a replicate to. And there's only a certain amount of combinations you could use. In our case, we're going to let the authorities, so the server's going to tell us 
how many players are in the game, and we'll send this information to all the clients. So replicate, so replicate from authority, replicate to client, right? So you can imagine that all the clients are gonna want to display that player's number overhead. Um, what else we have? Container. We won't get into this for now, just make this object. You could send arrays of things or whatever. Um, is public, you can leave that false. Is rewindable, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but you can leave this one false. Hope this is piquing your interest. Is predictable, false. <laughs> Exposed to editor, let's just make this false. The more things you make false, you know, the easier time you're gonna have. You, just, you don't have to worry about it, you know what I mean? Just live, live the simple life. Exposed to script. Oh, my IntelliSense didn't pick that one up. That's interesting. Leave that false as well. Generate event bindings. False. I should have. Description. False. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this, this is the one case. All right. OK. So you could add the description. This is the player's ID. I think that's it. All right, let's compile. Whew, I'm tired. I think I would have won the game if I just type out this network property. Uh, what I always do, it's always really helpful, is there's a dozen other components with network properties, network inputs, as well as documentation. You can just go to any one of those and copy and paste and then fill out the parts you're interested in. Let's see, I think we're done compiling. Oops. Sweet success. All right. Uh, so let's go back and use this property and we'll display it overhead. I don't think there's enough code here to warrant copying and pasting from the GitHub, but um, oh, there's one thing I forgot. It's a huge thing. This is replicating to the clients, and we've only overridden controllers. And where are controllers? Controllers live on the server and in the client in one case for the particular player. But we need to override the component, because every client's gonna see this, right? So let's say there's two players in the game. One of them you control, one of them you don't control. Um, but you still want to display something overhead, both of them. So we're going to introduce this concept of overriding the component. And I promise it's just as easy as overriding the controller. Um, once you compile this, the um, code gen will, like the controller, give us a template for the, um, for the player, or not the player, for the component. So compile errors are expected, that's fine, right? Basically what we're saying is, we're saying, hey, we'll override the component, but we haven't overridden the component yet. So it's going, what the heck is going on? So let's go back into our generated files. And now we will see a new class in here, right? Before we saw O3D con player controller, now we have O3DCon player. Sorry, I just made the screen smaller for you. Me. Ooh, wrong direction. There we go. Yeah. So let's add our player um, component. And we'll grab the CPP as well. All right, so just to reiterate, we're just grabbing the O3D con player class, not the O3D con player controller. And we'll copy and paste that as well. 
Okay. That looks good. Gonna build. Um, once we're done building, we'll do some non-networking um, code, like displaying some debug text overhead, but that shouldn't take too long. Cool, so that compiled down, great. All right, so let's set up what we need for debug draw. Uh, every tick, we're going to use debug draw and draw something overhead. In your game, you'll have real UI. This is just a, a quick fix. All right. And in the CPP, we will draw on tick. So we'll just make sure we're listening for those uh, AZ tick bus events. And likewise, when we deactivate, we'll stop listening. The red squigglies are letting me know I probably forgot to include something. I did. Let's include az core component tick bus. And we'll implement the, what happens on tick. How about this? Copy and paste. Okay, the code for doing this, three lines. Let's do it. We're gonna make a new string, player ID. You know what? I don't even care. It's three lines, let's just grab it. We're just gonna go to the code. We wanna skip to the networking part. All right, let's see, here's our own tick. Look at that, oh, see how I was right, three lines of code. Anyways, we're going to make a, a player ID string. It's just going to say player colon what the ID of the player. And probably need to include something. We're going to include that debug display bus. Mm -mm. Where is that located? AZ framework. Entity. Entity debug display bus dot h. Great. Okay. Cool. Now let's get to the fun part. So we want our server to let us know what player we are based on how many players are already in. Um, let's do that. We'll go on activate. So this is the controller. So on activate, we'll say if I'm an authority, if I'm an authority, we are going to set our player ID. Uh, let's see, we'll get the number of players in the game by grabbing the multiplayer interface. There's a variable called m underscore client connection count. That'll suit our needs. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll call this our player ID. So const and player ID equals, yeah, we'll just cast this to an int. And then we'll set our property. So this already gets generated in the base class. There's a set player ID method, and we just pass it in. Cool. So that should be it, right? So we have a network property that gets replicated from the authority to every client, at which point, so, it's, so when this player comes online, when it's activated, that will be sent out to every client. And then for every client on tick, they're going to grab that player ID and display it using a very simple debug display request bus. Not simple, readily available, we'll say that. And what's up? Oh, is it done? Cool. Yeah. Oh, one failure. Uh, also, I'd like to mention either my, either I'm extremely fast or my laptop is, has the wrong time on it. I think it's my laptop, right? Is it getting close to three? Okay. Cool. Uh, okay, so we'll just test that this hits. We're not using this variable. I'm going to say maybe it's unused. It's really not used. And then we'll wrap it up here. Oh, yeah, we're not using delta time here either. So when we play now, we expect to see two clients spawning in. The first one will say like player zero, and the other one will say player one. Oh, and we don't want to open the editor. We want to see this with two, two players, right? So let's do that. I'm going to go back to my game. And let's just open up the server launcher directly. So that's in bin profile, my multiplayer game server launcher. O3D con level, sweet, and let's spawn in a player, launch local client, oh, I saw him, I saw him, oh, it says player zero, this is a good sign, let's spawn one more, see if it says player one, oh, it does, look at that, look at that, cool, and I've already started moving because I was typing, whoa, yeah, all right, well, I'm out of time, wrap this up here. Um, if you go to the demo on my Git repo, it will go over other things like RPCs, which unfortunately we didn't have time to get to. Um, but yeah, so let's just rehash sort of what happened here today. We started a new multiplayer game using multiplayer template using our O3DE extras repo. We looked at how to create multiplayer components using XML and how those get generated into actual C++ code and how it will even give us a template for starting our own custom controllers and custom components. We looked into network input and the creation and processing of input and why that's important. 
and we looked at network properties. Um, cool. I'm here for questions, but otherwise you're free because that's all I have you for. <laughs>